We are following breaking news. Police are on the scene of a shooting near Daw Mills and York Mills that has left multiple people injured. And a dent has been made in the amount of crime in Durham region, thanks to Project Martini. Plus, dangerously hot and humid conditions this week as a heat dome lingers over the GTA. And we're going to tell you how schools in the GTA are planning to deal with this oppressive heat coming up. This is Live at Five. Good evening. I'm Bakari Savage. And I'm Lindsay Biscaya. Welcome to Live at Five. We have breaking news from North York emergency crews. They're on the scene of a shooting near Don Mills in York Mills. The police say that there are multiple injuries. Yeah, CP24's Melissa Duggan joins us live from the scene on Mallard Road with the very latest. Melissa, what do we know at this point? What I can show you right now, emotional scenes of reunification, children being brought out, some very young, just babies being wheeled out um, to be reunited with their families. You can see a, a carriage right now coming with some kids. Family members are waiting on the other side of this police tape. They were told there was an incident at the school, that their kids are okay, and they're going to have this chance to get connected to them uh, once they're able to move the kids out safely and bring them to their parents. Very tense scenes here. Parents are stressed. They just want their kids and they want to go home. They have been in communications with the school um, after word of gunshots being fired in this area. They've been receiving regular updates and I'm standing here with one parent. Christine, I understand that you're waiting for your baby right now. Actually, it's my sister and uh, sister-in-law that are waiting for their kids. I, I happened to pick up my kids before the lockdown and um, I was actually parked in the roundabout. I couldn't get out. And what's the school telling you? Uh, no, they they just said the police officer just said I couldn't leave. I couldn't. I couldn't get out. So I just was waiting in the um, in the roundabout until uh, the situation. And, and your kids, your your sister's kids, are they in the daycare at the school? Yeah, and my kids are too. So like I picked them up from the same daycare. How are you feeling right now? I'm in a bit of a shock. Yeah, because I, I, I did see the um, the officers go in with their their rifles or whatever yeah. whatever they're called. I saw them go into the school. Um, and I was I was literally right there at the roundabout, so I I got to see I got to see it sort of unfold, and I had my kids with me, so I was a little bit freaked out. And what did you see at the time as you saw it unfold? Um, it just a bunch of a bunch of officers that um, that looked like they were ready to take someone down. That's what it looked like. Okay. And where's your sister right now? Uh, she's she's here. She just she was just picking up her kids. So okay, so yeah. she's going to be reunited. And thanks for that, Christine. Oh, yeah. I'm also standing by with our crime analyst Steve Ryan, and this is an unusual s uh, scene here, Steve. What can you tell us from what you're seeing right here about what we can kind of infer as to what's happening inside that building? Well, we know from a uh, tweet sent out by EMS that three people are vital signs absent near this uh, school. Um, what we can draw as far as conclusions go based on the interaction that the police are having right now with these anxious parents that are waiting is that there is no suspect anywhere near this scene. Otherwise, we would all be pushed back a long distance away. And I did hear one of the officers tell one of the parents as they're bringing out some of the babies from the daycare that none of the children were, were injured. And that's got to come as a huge relief to families. And I mean, it is so emotional watching these babies, babies coming out and being held and, you know, handed over into their family's arms. So we do know that paramedics did not transport anyone from the scene here. Uh, what does that mean? So basically that tells us that the, the other than the three vital signs absent, so three people are deceased at the scene, and if there was anybody injured that they didn't require hospitalization. Um, but I think the big point right now uh, for us is to you know make it clear that there is no suspect near the scene and I say that only because I'm just looking at all these police officers around here and we're as close as we are if there was a suspect outstanding near this location the police would have us a long distance away and those babies wouldn't have come out in the arms of those officers like they did. But there is a significant presence here. We see armed police officers up and down the street. We're on Mallard right now. Um, this is south of York Mills just off Don Mills. What is this um, big police presence? Um, you know we see ambulances paramedics still around here. What does that tell you about this situation? Well it certainly suggests that the initial radio call was for uh, sound of gunshots or a person shot and given that it was at or near a school um, that would create the big police presence. This is why we see officers walking around here with the uh, long guns because 
when they initially responded, they didn't know what they're walking into. And this is why all these officers have a lot of their firearms out and in their hands. And you know, complicating matters too. You know, this isn't just a school. I saw teenagers walking out of here a little bit earlier on, uh, just walking out on their own. But it's also a daycare. You know, these tiny children. Um, what kind of a challenge does that pose to uh, for police to kind of get a handle on this scene? Well. For the scene itself, they are going to first off get an identification on the three deceased people, and then from there they'll be able to tell whether or not one of those three deceased was responsible for the shooting, or was there a suspect that we do not know uh, who it is right now. But if there was a suspect outstanding at this point in time, I can tell you from 30 years of policing experience that this scene would be treated a heck of a lot differently than it is right now. So that leads me to believe that this incident is all contained within this crime scene, and that there is nobody outstanding based on the police presence and based on the fact that. We are as close as we are, and the fact that the officers brought the babies out a couple at a time, clearly the, the area suggests that it is a safe zone at this point in time. Okay, that also must come as a relief to a lot of the families around here. Uh, this is an active situation, though. We are seeing cars pulling out of this uh, parking lot right now with some happy parents who have their kids safe in their vehicles at this time. But we do have to admit, not a lot of information has been coming out from police at this time. Uh, they're certainly just kind of working the scene at the moment. Is, is there a reason why we're not getting more for information from police at this time, Steve? Well, probably because this is... Uh, quite new as far as an occurrence goes, and the police need to get all their information confirmed before they release that to the public. But again, I'll stress, if there was a danger to the public at this point in time, the police would not allow us to stand as close as we are standing right now, nor would those babies have been taken out a couple at a time and handed over uh, to their parents. So it certainly suggests to me that the entire scene is contained within this crime scene. Otherwise, uh, again, as the public and as the media, the police would be treating this a lot differently if there was a concern for public safety. And we should mention, too, uh, the word of gunshots being fired coming out just before 3 o'clock. It's just after 5 o'clock right now, so not a lot of time um, uh, since then. Uh, we are going to keep an eye on the situation. Obviously, Steve, I think we're going to be here for quite some time. We're going to watch more of these family reunifications. Uh, but again, a word of gunshots coming this afternoon. We are hearing of victims at the scene. As soon as we get more information to confirm exactly what's happening here, we're going to let you in on it. We're going to send things back to you. Yeah, and just watching those babies being passed from the Police to the parents really gives you chills. Okay, CP24 is yeah. Melissa Duggan live at the scene with CP24's crime analyst Steve Ryan as well. Thanks for that. We'll check in with you later. Another headline: The third girl has pleaded guilty in the swarming death of a homeless man at the downtown core. The teen, who was 13 at the time of the incident, pleaded guilty today to manslaughter in the death of Kenneth Lee. Police have alleged Lee, who was 59 and living in the city's shelter system, died after he was swarmed and stabbed by a group of girls in December of 2022. Eight girls between the ages of 13 and 16 were arrested shortly after and charged with second-degree murder. And more than 90 people have been arrested in a drug and human trafficking investigation in Durham Region. Durham Regional Police released the results of Project Martini, an investigation they say they undertook at the urging of local business people concerned about drug trafficking and human trafficking in the region. Investigators say throughout their efforts, they confiscated drugs worth $600,000 on the street. Three kilograms of meth, one kilogram of cocaine, one kilogram of fentanyl, and $30,000 in cash. Now, the investigation spanned the entire region, including Oshawa, Clarington, Whitby, and Ajax, and it resulted in the execution of 11 search warrants, 92 arrests, and 113 criminal charges. The project also helped 62 people access public health support programs and 38 people access support programs for sex trade workers. Throughout the duration of Project Martini, our officers seized a large number of drugs, confiscating more than three kilograms of methamphetamine, more than one kilogram of cocaine, close to one kilogram of fentanyl, and over $30,000 in cash. The street value of the drug seized amounted to more than $600,000. Project Martini enforcement initiatives spanned across the region, including Oshawa, Clarington, Whitby, and Ajax, resulting in the execution of 11 search warrants 92 arrests, and the laying of 113 criminal charges. This project was undertaken as in response to a number of business complaints as well as uh, overdose data which we had captured from our health partners. And we focused, it our, for, we focused our enforcement efforts on the areas identified as overdose hotspots. In total, we arrested 92 people, 124 criminal charges, and uh, seized $600,000 worth of controlled substances.
This project, uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands that if you're going to deal drugs in our city and the region of Durham, you are unwelcome. And this is a national crisis that we are facing, and I'm calling on all levels of government uh, to stand forward to be able to address this health crisis. Across this country, we're losing 24 people a day in regards to this drug epidemic. We have un unhoused, unsheltered, homeless individuals that are struggling, the most vulnerable in our community, and we need to do a better job than what we're doing today. Some pro-Palestinian protesters are speaking out about their treatment in custody after they were recently arrested. And they gathered outside the courthouse on Armory Street this morning and outlined their allegations of abuse after being arrested. Four people were arrested earlier this month at a rally outside the U.S. consulate on University Avenue. They claimed that they were assaulted by police and have had unreasonable bail conditions imposed on them, including protest bans. I am not allowed to participate in or be associated with any protest, assembly, or demonstration for any cause. This contradicts my rights under the Canadian Charter. However, I am not surprised by the actions of TPS because I am an Indigenous woman. Well, demonstrators say that more than 70 people have been arrested at rallies since the start of the war between Israel and Hamas October 7. York Regional Police are investigating a serious collision in Markham. It has sent multiple people to hospital. It happened at Simonston Boulevard and Don Mills Road, just south of John Street, around 1.30. It was a three-vehicle crash that included a large truck. Police say a number of people were sent to hospital, including one person with life-threatening injuries. Speaking of the roads. Yeah, it's 5, 12, 29 degrees. Let's get a check on the rush hour commute with CP24's traffic specialist, Agile in Sierra Bois. How bad are things, Agile? Oh, it's uh, pretty bad. If you're making your way out, it's going to take you a lot of time, especially on the eastbound 4-1. We have problems piling up. We'll start with the collision I've been watching uh, for the last little bit. Bakari, eastbound on the 4-1. This is in the express. Uh, just as you make around the approach to the 400, looks like the right lane and shoulder out with this ongoing collision. Then a little bit further along, eastbound 4-1 in the collectors at Keel, right underneath the Keel overpass. You can see the flashers are on. Center lane blocked. That's with the stall. I'd add a little bit of insult to injury if you're headed on the eastbound 401 in the collectors. No access to the ramp to the 404 because behind the trees there is a jackknife transport truck. You're being forced onto the southbound Don Valley Parkway, but the express ramp is accessible. And your other issue is on the northbound Western Road on ramp to the westbound 401. Looks like the right lane of that ramp is blocked with a collision. On city streets in North York, dealing with the crash on Dufferin and Steels. I'll send it back to you. This CP24 traffic report is brought to you by 407 ETR. Enjoy the journey with a stress-free commute. Yeah, we were just looking at the haze from that yeah. traffic jam. Yeah, a hot start to the week. <laughs> you know what? It's going to continue at least through Friday. Yeah, most of that haze due to that heat. CP24's Andrew Brennan joins us live from the waterfront with more on the heat warning and how to cope. Andrew looks like he's coping pretty well, in my opinion. <laughs> he still has his tie done up. Yeah. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Bakari, you need to stop being Andrew's tie police. Listen, I am being my authentic self, and I am enjoying myself at the beach. I got my book. I got the microphone, so I can't really describe the fact that I got my water. I'm staying hydrated. I'm staying cool. I'm staying learned it. And for people at home, just an emphasis on trying to stay cool, by the way. You do get a good amount of, well, let's say it is a relief from being near the water. Lake effect gives a, a temperature swing of seven degrees difference here versus being up towards Pearson. So quite a bit cooler here. But I will re remind people at home, if you are looking to go swimming at a beach along Lake Ontario, check with the city of Toronto's Oh, at the City of Toronto website first because right now it is considered unsafe to swim here at, Mer at the beach because of the E. coli levels, indicators for other germs in the water. So just wanted to recommend that. And of course, you can hear in the background the megaphone telling people that as well. We are in what's called a heat dome. What is that in fact? Senior climatologist with Environment Canada, Dave Phillips, helped us fill in the blanks. Take a listen. It's like putting the Rogers Center over a good chunk of North America from Atlanta, Georgia to Atlantic Canada. And the air doesn't circulate. It just stays there. In fact, what happens under the dome is the air actually squeezes down. And it, all those little air molecules jiggle and jaggle and create more heat. The heat can't go anywhere. It stays put. And it gets hotter as you get down to the, um, 
uh, to the to the surface. That does present air quality concerns, particularly people with respiratory issues. Also, there are challenges for people regulating their body temperature and not just people, animals as well. We'll talk about that later on in the show. But just a reminder, because of the heat right now with Humidex values hitting 40, to check on those in your life that are considered vulnerable, that you consider vulnerable, consider vulnerable always a good thing to do. Sending it inside. Okay, going back to that breaking news that we've been covering all afternoon, we do have an update right now. Yeah, CP24's Melissa Duggan joins us live from the scene on Mallard Road with that update. What can you tell us, Melissa? First of all, we have to start off by saying all the kids are safe, but we can now confirm that three adults are deceased. Uh, they were in the lobby of an office space at this school uh, that's on Mallard. It is near Don Mills and York Mills. And uh, those three adult victims, again, pronounced dead at the scene. The investigation is ongoing. What we've been watching for the last little while here is a very emotional reunification. We are seeing children being brought out from a daycare at this school and reunited with their families in the parking lot. We're seeing a lot of tears out here. I'm with a crime analyst. Steve Ryan and you said you would never thought you'd see in Toronto an evacuation by crib. Yeah, that certainly was uh, shocking to watch those babies being um, pushed out in evacuation cribs, but it's a good sign in this sense. It certainly does suggest that, uh, well, first off, the school was in lockdown, and when a school is in lockdown, doors get locked, nobody gets in or out. The kids are all hidden away until the police make the area safe. The fact that these kids are being released to their parents certainly suggests to me almost I would say 100% uh, that that school has been cleared and that there is nobody no suspect in the school or around this area because the kids wouldn't have come out if there was and we as uh, civilian people wouldn't be standing as close as we are if there was a concern of a suspect outstanding. Now work came of shots fired around 3 30 this afternoon that resulted in a lockdown at the school what does that mean and how did officers go through and clear the scene? So the lockdown, again, so means that there is a threat in the school or near the school. Doors get locked. Nobody comes into the school. Nobody comes out of the school. The classroom doors get closed and locked as well. Blinds get drawn and people hide the, the children, uh, get hidden away until the police clear the school. The fact that the kids have been released in the last 20 minutes or so certainly tells me, well, the lockdown's been lifted. So that suggests that there is no suspect threat in or near the school. And the police would have cleared that with long guns. Uh, they would have had officers go in there with long guns and the uh, canine unit would have gone in as well, made sure that the entire school was a safe area and that's when they decided to un do the do the unlocking of the school and releasing all the kids. And we did see older students. We saw teenagers walk out of the school wearing their uniforms, but it is those babies in daycare that are still being taken out uh, by um, school staff at this moment. Um, I, I, we do see this large police presence here right now. We do know that there are three adults deceased. Do we have any information about, um, about the suspect, anything like that at this time, or what this scene might tell you about the suspect? So no information on a suspect right now, but what this suggests to me is that the scene is contained within this crime scene, meaning that it appears as though um, there's no threat to public safety. Otherwise, again, we would not be this close. The kids wouldn't have been released. Certainly suggests to me that of those three deceased, one of them may have been involved in the shooting. And this is why, at this point in time, the parents are allowed to be close. We as the media are allowed to be close. Huge police presence here because they responded to the initial call of shots fired. And it wasn't until afterwards that you learn of the three deceased and the fact that they've cleared the school. There's no outstanding suspects at the school. And we're not being told to clear this area here public safety being paramount certainly does suggest to me in a big way uh, that one of those three deceased may have been responsible for the shooting. So no threat here at the moment. And I also want to mention too, I'm sure there are more parents, more families coming out here to find their students, whether they're older, whether they're younger in the daycare. Police are going to be setting up some TTC buses. We're seeing them pull up just now. That is going to be a place where um, kids will be located. They'll be able to reunite with families there. So they will be able to take more of these young people out of the school, move them to this safe place. But again, no risk in this area and we're going to see more of these family reunifications at this time but again the breaking news at this moment we can now confirm three adults are deceased dead at this school back to you okay and again this has been team coverage
with CP24's Melissa Duggan, as well as CP24's crime analyst Steve Ryan. Again, they're live on the scene at Mallet Road, which is near Don Mills and York Mills. Time now is 520, 29 degrees. This is Toronto's breaking news, CP24. Here's a live look once again at the scene. Three adults are dead after that shooting in North York. We'll have more updates for you coming up. A potential strike looms at the LCBO with workers ready to hit the picket lines amid contract talks. CP24's Beatrice Faisman joins us live now with more. And there is expected to be some kind of update this evening, Beatrice, whether we'll know what it means or not tonight. That's right. We don't know if it's going to be a public update, Lindsay, but it's at 7.30 tonight. The union is going to be meeting with its members uh, from OPSU to talk about the negotiations, where they stand now, what are the key sticking points in this bargaining between OPSU and the LCBO, uh, and what is the status of the negotiations period at this point. Uh, there's been a large concern, obviously, by, by the LCBO, uh, the union representing some of these LCBO workers, uh, because the province is gradually expanding alcohol sales in the province. Beer, wine, ready-to-drink beverages in big box stores, grocery stores, convenience stores across the province. And so these employees have been without a contract since March 31st. Uh, and so now they're looking to essentially score the best deal they possibly can. Over the weekend, they had a kind of a testing of the pulse of their members. 97% of the almost 10,000 unionized workers voted in favor of a strike if there is an impasse and no deal can be reached. How are consumers reacting? Here's, some, here's what they're telling us. I just work at the Woodbine Racetrack, so I come here every day. You know, so it's, it's going to be a shame. We don't hear nothing about it, but I think if they're going to pass, it's okay. It's not right to close, right? People are going to go crazy about it. It's not really a big deal because the best store is still open. Right now, I'm not drinking, so at this point, right now, no, it wouldn't be any inconvenience at all. As for what the LCBO is saying, it says LCBO does not want to strike. We have several bargaining dates this week where we will resume negotiations with a focus on achieving a renewal collective agreement with OPSU that is fair for our unionized employees and helps the LCBO operate efficiently and effectively for Ontarians in a changing marketplace. Uh, also adding that the LCBO is going to have a contingency plan in place so that there's no interruption to consumers. Lindsay and Bacardi. Okay, that was CP24's Beatrice Faisman. Thanks, B. Okay, it's 524, 29 degrees. This is Live at 5. We'll be right back after the break. And a crushing defeat for Belgium today in their match against Slovakia. Is that enough here for the referee to disallow the goal? We're about to find out. Belgium broken. It's not going to count. Romelu Lukaku had not one but two goals ruled out after video review, leading to a shocking 1-0 loss to Slovakia. Ivan Trent scored the only goal that counted in the seventh minute of the match. And a brutal bounce for Austria in their match with France French star Kylian Mbappe crossing one into the box, leading to an own goal. It was the difference maker in the 1-0 win for France in Group D action. And Romania got off to a roaring start in their opening match in Group E at the Euro Cup. Unfortunately, it came at the expense of Ukraine, who fumbled it in their own end, leading to a brilliant strike from Nikolai Stanchu just before halftime. Romania would score two more in the second half on their way to a 3-0 victory. It is 528 now, 29 degrees. Feels like 37, though. This is Live at 5. And we're following breaking news. Three people have been pronounced dead at the scene of a shooting in North York. We're going to have a live update from the scene with Melissa Duggan and TV24's crime analyst Steve Ryan coming up. We have an update on our breaking news that we've been following all afternoon, a shooting on Mallard Road. CP24's Melissa Duggan is there, and she joins us live from the scene from Mallard Road with the very latest on what we know. Melissa. 
Yeah, we're outside of Whitfield School right now in the parking lot area. This serving as a reunification zone uh, for parents and for young kids at a daycare that is just located right behind me here. We've been watching young kids, some just babies being brought out in cribs to be reunited with their families. We've got to say, though, kids are safe, but there are three adults who have been pronounced dead at the scene. As for how this reunification has been working, parents have been communicating with the school. Uh, some employees have been coming out, taking down information, going back, bringing the kids out. It has been emotional, to say the least. Here's what some families are telling us. So, uh, she got the message from the daycare that um, I mean, you cannot come to pick the child up because there is some, some incident here, so they are not allowing anybody to come. Yeah. And then she was in touch, and now after that she has been told that you can come now, yeah. and then uh, the child would be you know, brought outside. Of course, I'm very uncomfortable and just anxious to get, see my kid, uh, as are all parents, I'm sure. So. What did the school tell you? Uh, nothing. It's just, we just, we don't know. Uh, we, I read online the police's tweet, but other than that, we don't know much. Seriously, we feel very unsafe. Yeah, yes, yeah. very we, unsafe. We came to Canada just to, because we know that it's, it's a very safe country. It's, the things like that, which happens in U.S., doesn't happen here, but... Again, we're on Mallard Road, south of York Mills, just off Don Mills, and we're seeing more of these tiny kids coming out here and some very happy families who have been waiting to greet them. And because we are seeing this reunification, Steve, I'm bringing you in, our crime analyst, Steve Ryan, um, that should tell us that there isn't a threat here at the moment. 100%. There's no threat here to uh, the public, that's for sure. Otherwise, these babies behind us um, would not be brought out the way they were. The lockdown would have been lifted. So one of two things, either the suspect is long gone and the police are aware of that or the suspect is part of the crime scene uh, which could be one of the three deceased in the office building. Now I think it's important to, to point out that that office building has not been confirmed as being part of the school but regardless the office building is close enough to the school that the school would be affected in the same way and that would have been the lockdown of the school then the police would have cleared that uh, school out regardless if it happened in the school or near the school and then they would not release the children until the area was clear from any uh, suspects but just the way they're, they're coming out now and the way the officers are standing here and has the fact that we are as close as we are to the scene does suggest that, that there is no threat to the public safety. Can you give us some insight? We're seeing these officers holding the hand of just a little baby here. What does, how does it change things for officers when they're working with kids who are just so small? Well, they are the worst calls to get as a police officer. I can tell you there's two of them. One is an officer who is injured um, on the job or, or killed and children. Anytime one of those two is affected in a radio call, you'll see this huge response. And this is why there is such a large police response here right now because the initial call would have been for the sound of gunshots or a person shot. That would have caused all these officers to attend. Then they would clear the school. Once the school was cleared, then they would do the reunification with the appearances. That's what we've witnessed so far. So we can confirm a shooting here has left three adults dead. All kids are safe, though. Staff still calling out the names of families and children to reunite them. Buses being brought out as well here uh, as more families keep coming in, bringing their kids home safe. Going to throw things back to you. Yeah, just seeing those images of oh, those little children running towards their parents is just so emotional. Okay, CP24's Melissa Duggan and our crime analyst Steve Ryan at the scene with the latest. Thank you. More than 90 people have been arrested in a drug and human trafficking investigation in Durham Region. Durham Regional Police released the results of Project Martini, which is an investigation they say they undertook at the urging of local business people concerned about drug trafficking and human trafficking in the region. Investigators say through their efforts, they confiscated drugs worth $600,000 on the street, three kilograms of meth, one kilogram of cocaine, one kilogram of fentanyl, and $30,000 in cash. The investigation spanned the entire region, including Oshawa, Clarington, Whitby, and Ajax, and it resulted in the execution of 11 search warrants, 92 arrests, and 113 criminal charges. The project also helped 62 people access public health support programs and 38 people access support programs for sex trade workers. We see it every day when we're out there. We realize we can't arrest away this problem. Uh, simply, simply enforcing the law isn't enough. We have to create opportunities by doing these arrests and limiting the supply of drugs to allow uh, the, our community partners to come in and when the supply is reduced to, uh, to help the people who are, who are being preyed upon in this situation.
These arrests and seizures have put a significant dent into the drug trafficking in Durham region. However, this work is ongoing and we know that we can't do this alone. Collaboration with our community partners is crucial if we are to see continued success at stopping drug trafficking within our region. This project helps 62 different individuals access public health support programs and an additional 38 individuals to access support programs for sex trade workers. This demonstrates that we will do everything we possibly can to make sure that this is a, a community of law and order, that this community will not tolerate drug uh, sales in our community. And the one thing that really um, uh, kind of highlighted in this particular project that I was very pleased about uh, was the human trafficking component. These are individuals that are the most vulnerable in our community that are being victimized. Durham Regional Police does an incredible job in regards to our human trafficking uh, division, and this gives uh, individuals the opportunity to be able to recover, get onto pathways uh, so that they may have new opportunities in their lives. And I think that's an important part. And a third girl has pleaded guilty in the swarming death of a homeless man in the downtown court. The teen, who was 13 at the time of the incident, pleaded guilty today to manslaughter in the death of Kenneth Lee. And police have alleged Lee, who was 59 and living in the city shelter system, died after he was swarmed and stabbed by a group of girls in December of 2022. Eight girls between the ages of 13 and 16. They were arrested shortly afterwards and charged with second degree murder. And some pro-Palestinian protesters are speaking out about their treatment in custody after they were recently arrested. They gathered outside the courthouse on Armory Street this morning and outlined their allegations of abuse after being arrested. Four people were arrested earlier this month at a rally outside the U.S. consulate on University Avenue. They claim they were assaulted by police and have had unreasonable bail conditions imposed on them, including protest bans. I am not allowed to participate in or be associated with any protest, assembly, or demonstration for any cause. This contradicts my rights under the Canadian Charter. However, I am not surprised by the actions of TPS because I am an Indigenous woman. Demonstrators say more than 70 people have been arrested at rallies since the start of the war between Israel and Hamas on October 7th. York Regional Police are investigating a serious collision in Markham. It sent multiple people to hospital. It happened at Simonston Boulevard and Dunn Mills Road, south of John Street, around 1.30. It was a three-vehicle crash that included a large truck. And police say that a number of people were sent to hospital, including one person with life-threatening injuries. It's 5.38 now. Time now, right in the heart of rush hour, to get a check on the roads with Ajua. Yeah, we're definitely in the heart, guys. It's a slow go out there, and I've been watching quite a few issues if you're trying to make your way home, especially on that eastbound 401. A brand new problem just coming into the traffic desk. It's on the eastbound lanes of the 401, in the express and the transfers, just on the approach to the 427. So if you're in the express, right lane is blocked, and if you're in the transfer lanes, it is uh, the left lane that is occupied, so it's really, really slow. Then from this point, for the east on the four. This time in the express, just on the approach to the 400, actually past the 400, crews are dealing with the collision. Now it looks like the two right lanes are blocked. Uh, we had some problems. Uh, they were happening on uh, the eastbound 401 underneath Keel in the overpass there. It was uh, the right lane in the collector's block. The stall looks like that one cleared. Ongoing collision eastbound 401 in the express at Keel, past Keel actually. It is uh, the right lane occupied and still no access uh, to the northbound 404 via the eastbound 401 collectors. It's been closed because of an ongoing stall and even more issues. Uh, this is the northbound Western Road on ramp to the westbound 401. That right lane is blocked uh, following a collision. Also problems on the eastbound 407 ramp to the northbound 400. Crews dealing with a collision on that ramp. It's blocking the right lane. So a busy afternoon, guys. I'll send it back to you. Yeah, looking really slow out there. Okay, Adjua, thank you. It's 539, 29 degrees. This is live at 5. Coming up, dangerously hot and humid conditions this week as a heat dome lingers over the GTA. And we continue to follow breaking news. Three people are dead following a shooting in the lobby of an office space in North York. Welcome back. It is a hot start to the week, and it's going to continue at least through Friday. Right now, let's check in with TV24's Andrew Brennan, who's live from the waterfront with more on the heat warning and how to cope. Andrew, we last left you. You were going to check out some, you know, maybe cool treats from mm -hmm. the ice cream truck. What happened? <laughs> it left. 
<laughs> it left. <laughs> and I'm so sad. <laughs> I'm so sad. I can't put it into words. I got off the line with you, Bakari, and I turned around. He was making the sound of, come here, hither, come children, please, we have ice cream, but you have to buy it. And I thought this was going to be the greatest day ever. And then the ice cream truck left. It's gone. It's not there anymore. But that's okay. Um, there are other ways to keep cool. One of the big ones being uh, lake effect, which my uh, scientifically inclined cameraman Tom gave me the actual scientific term for. I've forgotten it. But the difference between here and being up at the uh, at the airport at Pearson, where we have data from Environment Canada, it's seven degrees cooler here. And I can definitely feel it. A few things to bear in mind. If you are going to be going for a beach day, we are at one of the beaches in Toronto that, according to the city, is unsafe right now based on E. coli levels. So bear that in mind. And thankfully, there's not many people in the water right now. But if you're going to come out, just a recommendation. Uh, these temperatures can be great. They can also be a little scorching, a little stifling and, you know, challenging to deal with. We don't have good heat-related deaths and illness numbers coming from the public health in Ontario or from the coroner's office, so it's really hard to gauge. But some estimates that are about 15 years old now say there's roughly 100 to 120 people that die from heat-related illness in the Toronto every year. Now, it's not just people that have to deal with the heat. There are, of course, people that are vulnerable that do not have places to get out of the heat regularly. But we also have to bear in mind four-legged friends, our dogs and pets, particularly certain breeds of dogs, have a lot of challenges regulating heat and their temperature outside. We did speak with the Humane Society earlier to get their expertise. Old animals, animals that are overweight or obese, anybody with a with like a smushed nose, so those brachycephalic dogs, like your pugs and your bulldogs and things like that, so they can have challenges breathing even in cool weather, let alone when it gets hot. Animals with underlying heart or respiratory disease, animals with underlying um, endocrinological problems like hypothyroidism, things like that. So, you know, young, fit, lean, body weight animals are going to have fewer problems than some of the others. And then sometimes it's the um, like the Labradors, right, who like go and go and go and kind of don't know when to stop. Sometimes even the young ones, we have to sort of intervene and say, hey, that's enough. Let's just have a rest right now. So try to regulate your body heat as best you can. Thanks, Tom. Water works. Getting in shade. Do your best. Lindsay, I know you guys have air conditioning in there. For those that don't have it out here, it's just about finding shade and water where you can. But... Life is a beach sometimes, so I'm going to go enjoy it. You should. And you know what? You're doing one thing, right, Andrew? You're wearing light clothing, which is another thing you can do to keep uh, cool. So you're at least doing that right. CP24 is Andrew Brennan at the beach for us. Thanks, Andrew. Meanwhile, the TDSB says schools are doing what they can to keep kids cool as well. Some schools have limited classrooms or limited areas with some level of air conditioning, and they, they'll rotate the kids through it right? Um, sometimes they'll go to the gym. Gym may or may not have air, con air conditioning, but it's down below, so it's cooler. It depends on the school. Kid Crew founder and director Dr. Dina Kulik says that children can be particularly susceptible to the effects of extreme heat. Many kids won't sweat as much as older people, and sweating is a way to help regulate that body temperature. So I wouldn't be looking at specifically what your child looks like in terms of sweat, but rather are they not as interactive with you as before? Are they losing consciousness? Are they confused? Do they have headache? Are they suffering from dizziness? And importantly, are they not saying that they're thirsty anymore? Because that's a later stage in terms of heat stroke. We want to make sure that your kids are drinking lots, even if they're not saying they're thirsty, even if they're not asking for water. And Toronto's Catholic Board has also released a statement. And most TCDSB schools have air-conditioned areas, cooling centers within the facility, as well as shaded areas to provide students with respite from the heat. The board's also piloting the use of missing stations at 12 elementary schools within the system to provide the school communities with further relief during outdoor activities. Additionally, staff and students will be encouraged to stay hydrated throughout the day. 
The Ministry of Education says each year our government provides school boards with approximately $1.4 billion to renew and improve schools. School boards can use some of this funding to install air conditioners in schools. Additionally, for the current and upcoming school year, our government has invested $29.5 million in the annual school operations allocation to optimize ventilation in schools, which includes installing higher grade filters where possible and increasing fresh air intake. All right, let's switch things up a little bit. A special screening of the highly anticipated documentary, I Am Celine Dion. It's being held tonight in three cities ahead of its release next week. We're joined live from New York by ETOX, Lainey Liu, who is on the red carpet. Lainey, so good to see you. So this is your first time interviewing Celine. Uh, I know you're really excited about this. Tell us, uh, what the, what's the mood like there? Well, the mood, um, I don't know if you can see, it's its buzzing. Everybody is excited to Celine. We are expecting her. And Celine is very generous with her time. She wants to talk to people about this documentary. She wants to share her experience. So, yes, I am expecting to speak to Celine Dion for the first time in my career. I'm so excited. But mostly, it's just so good to see her back out, uh, back outside, as they say, and talking about her experience and able to tell her story. I think that's key here. There have been a lot of questions questions about what she's been going through and she is the one who wants to set the record straight and give us all the information. Hey Lainey, along with that, you know, last week I actually saw an interview with Celine Dion and Hoda Kotb. They were talking about this. There were a lot of tears shared when going over, you know, different parts of this documentary. Can you talk about what she's been saying? Well, she's really been giving a lot of detail about her disease, which is stiff person syndrome, and she's recounting how her symptoms started. She's also telling us that, you know, while we thought maybe it was the last two or three years that she was struggling with this, she said actually she's been dealing with this for as many as 17 years. So this is something that she's been hiding. This is something she's been enduring. She's performed through. Um, and so we have more information about her last two decades, actually. And this is how forthcoming she has been with her personal struggles and it's going to be really interesting to see how people respond to this documentary and the information she shares in it. Yeah and just lastly Lainey I mean is such a Canadian icon Celine Dion and to see her going through this obviously she has a lot of fans around the world um, you know how striking do you think this documentary is going to be in terms of her getting her message out there and people really being able to finally see what she's been going through? Well, I think it's tremendously impactful. I mean, she is the most high-profile person who has this illness, and so this is her goal. She wants to let people know uh, what it's like. She wants to uh, increase awareness. She wants to make sure that the people in her position aren't suffering and can have the, uh, the help and the resources and the access to the resources that, uh, that are out there. So uh, that's, this definitely will be impactful because it's her. It's Celine telling the story. Okay, that is ETOX. Lainey Liu joining us live from New York. Thanks so much, Lainey. Thank right you. Now, right now it's 550, 29 degrees. This is Live at 5. If you want to fly within Canada this summer, it looks like you're going to be paying a lot more. We're going to explain coming up. A new report says that travelers are paying a lot more to fly within Canada this summer. Yeah, the Flight Center Travel Group says ticket prices for domestic flights in July through to September rose an average of 14 percent over the past 12 months. The agency says that hike is especially noticeable on short-haul flights. It says plateauing seat capacity and less competition are some of the reasons for the trend. Canada has lost nine aircraft uh, operated by Lynx Air uh, over the last couple of months. And when you remove nine aircraft from the domestic fleet, uh, that means there are more people during the summer peak chasing after fewer seats that are available in the marketplace. And it's a very basic question of supply and demand, where you've got increased summer demand and fewer seats available for sale. And we continue to follow breaking news. Three people are dead following a shooting that happened in the lobby of an office space in New York. CP24 Melissa Duggan, as well as CP24's crime analyst Steve Ryan, are live from the scene.
We are following breaking news tonight. Three people are dead in North York, and CP24's Melissa Duggan is at the scene tonight. She joins us live from Mallard Road with the latest. Melissa. Yeah, so the fatal shooting happening in the lobby of an office space here, but there are schools in the area and a daycare certainly complicating matters, but all kids are safe. That's the big bottom line here. We've been watching all afternoon as young people and parents have been reunited. I mean, we're talking babies that have been pulled out in cribs, all safe and put into their very relieved parents' arms here. No search for suspects. We can tell you that at the moment. This is a, an area that was locked down a little earlier. Officers have cleared this space. We have been talking to people um, at this scene. Here's what some of them are telling us. The only thing I heard was the sirens. And then because we're at L.A., there was a lot of firefighters and everyone just pulling through in our parking lot. So that's why we came here to figure out what was going on. And when you came out, were you able to see anybody out front of the school? Um, no, they are. There was just a lot of police and SWAT teams and stuff here dealing with that. Um, right now, I'm just kind of worried because to me, it's like at the end of the day, imagine if that person shot someone and then ran into our business and we have members there. To me, now it's kind of making me think like, what is an extra precaution that we can take for, to avoid something like that? So word of gunshots coming out at about 325 this afternoon on Mallard Road. This is south of York Mills, just off Don Mills. We've been watching workers from this daycare bringing out kids in kind of rounds, um, several kids at a time. Uh, some of them, you know, when you see them on, uh, on a trip outside of school, holding on to that string and walking out of the school, well, that's kind of what we've been seeing here this afternoon. The kids being calm, though, I got to say, watching the workers, you know, try to t treat the kids like, hey, everything's fine. And the police um, also waving to them, everyone really having as uh, calm an atmosphere as they can during this re reunification process. We are expected to hear more from police soon. We are going to be staying on the scene for more updates. But again, I can confirm three adults dead. CP24 is Melissa Duggan reporting live from that scene tonight. Thanks, Melissa. All right, it's 559, 29 degrees. This is Toronto's breaking news, CP24. Thank you for watching.